So first of all, I'm, I would like to say, to tell you how happy I am to be in this very beautiful Cinematheque and uh, to, to discover Macedonia and uh, to be hosted in this uh, very interesting and uh, unique festival. So thank you, thank you very much. And the uh, second thing I would like to <clears throat> tell you why I, I choose this film uh, for two basic reasons. The first is that, uh, of course, it's, it's a very important film in, uh, in film history, and I think it is uh, Hitchcock's tragic masterpiece. But the second, the more important reason is that, uh, for, for the festival, is that uh, uh, it's one of the greatest films reflecting on images. And um, so it's much more than that, so that of course, there are, there are uh, I don't know how many interpretations of the film. It's one of the most interpreted films in the literature. But uh, I, will, I would like to, to tell you this, uh, to explain you this interpretation of the film, uh, Vertigo, as an immense problematic reflection on image. And um, Vertigo as a most tragic metafilm. So, but before going this in, into this uh, analysis, I think it's important to have a, a very short digression for uh, our uh, philosopher friends, and um, I would like to, to tell uh, the, the way, very shortly, the way I think uh, Western thought has uh, conceived, as uh, uh, reflected on image. Uh, I think there are two, two main, two main uh, conceptions of image, uh, which, by the way, I, are also uh, very similar to the two main conceptions of language in our world. The standard conception, the most ancient and which is still the, the common opinion today, is that images like words are labels. We put on our ideas our reality. Uh, they allow ideas and reality to be shared, to be shown. Which means that we have ideas independently of images and of words. Reality exists for us independently, independently uh, of uh, images and words. And so, uh, images and words represent, or not, properly, such inner ideas below, such reality uh, be below. So they are true or false, they are good or bad, depending on the way they represent. The alternative conception, which is the basis of modern philosophy of language and of image, is that images and words are not good or bad labels, on something that already exists. They don't, they don't work as an illustration. They rather work as a revelation, as tools for something that we couldn't make work otherwise. There is no such a thing as a reality without images and without words, first. And second, therefore, images and words cannot be true or false. They exist with us and as a part of us. They can only be more or less powerful wonderful or fearful, overwhelming or useless. Images can make us think, can make us even invent, they make us cry or fall in love, okay, which is the purpose of the film. I will come back on it, of course. But if you don't accept this second way of conceiving images and words, art will always be for you a secondary thing, second to something more important, more serious below. You just appreciate a film, a picture, a novel, and so on, on the basis of what they talk about, as a mere illustration. But we have to appreciate art for its own form and the way such form lives. The phenomenality of the form is what art is about, a sensitive, living, and thinking form. For, against the mainstream philosophy, art teaches us that sensitive world is not a distraction for a true world beyond, supposed to be more intelligent and important. That, and that this, is, this is why even more art can, be, art can be a true philosophy of sensitive world. Okay, I, I, I stop here this uh, digression, and uh, let's go back now to, to Vertigo. I will outline an analysis at the end of which we will find the conflict of these two conceptions of image. And that will explain why Vertigo is a most tragic metafilm. Okay, let us start our interpretation of the film in a classic way. What is the film about? Let's start from the most, most basic level, the narration. What is the story of Vertigo? 
The answer for me is vertigo cannot be reduced to one story. There are two, at least. The story of a crime and a deception to hide it, a murder, a murder disguised as a suicide, and the story of a love and the madness of experiencing it, a passion for a wrong person. Therefore, vertigo consists clearly of two stories, which in turn are not straightforward, but twofold. We can also start from another basic question and we'll find the same answer. What genre of film is vertigo? The answer for me is vertigo cannot be reduced to one genre. There are two at least. A detective film, a policeman has to find the truth about a woman, and a sentimental drama, a man struggles to join a woman he desires. But in this case too, the two genres are not straightforward but twofold. The, the detective story is about first a woman and then about the death that occurs. The love story is about first a living person and then a dead person. The protagonist too is of course twofold, a detective and a lover. Eh? And that is the problem, the narrative problem of the film. The themes too are double. Vertigo is about cognition, identity, truth on the one hand and impulse, affection, love on the other. We may start by resuming vertigo in a very proper way, I think, by claiming that vertigo is the actual vertigo of a man between his rationality and his inner drives. Vertigo is for sure an actual vertigo. And this is the first and most evident element of the self-reflection of the film, right from its title, and then from its open credits. <clears throat> The spiral is the diagram of the vertigo, the picture, we may say, the, the picture of the meaning of the film. The spiral, like vertigo itself, the film, is a moving picture of going around in circles, of spinning freely, like the whole film, isn't it? And sinking and plunging, the spiral is the image of the same that is different, the one that is twofold, multifold, hence vertiginous. Okay, let's go back to, the cross, to a close reading of the film after this first general interpretation. We said the protagonist is split into two, but this is also true for the narrative of the film itself. Vertigo starts with someone falling from a roof, finishes with someone also falling from a roof, as right in the middle, as an axis of symmetry, someone falling from the roof. So, also it is split into, into two also from a narrative point of view. Moreover, in all, three, on all these cases, it is Scotty who sees this falls, and it is us with Scotty. Here, another essential point. The whole film is seen from the point of view of Scotty, but even in this case, there is a splitting into two. In the second half of the film, we adopt for a moment the point of view of Judy, when she rests in a hotel room and writes the letter. A letter that Scotty will never read. So we, don't, we don't have to forget that for a moment we leave Scotty and we know something that Scotty will never know. Hmm? We know it at the end, but in another way. In other words, in the second half of the film, we see the film not only from the point of view of Scotty, but also from a vantage point that drive us to be detached from Scotty. We are with Scotty and against him. Since we can, now, we can see now how unreasonable, pathological he is. And yet we have identified with him. Huh? Thus we have to reconsider our own position in, this fir in the first part of the film. The first part we, we are with Scotty and the second we are not anymore with Scott. Huh? Uh, once again, this means that the vertigo is a self-reflecting experience. The spectator has to re-see the film, eh? uh, the thing he saw before, eh? during the film itself. Uh, I would put it in, a following, in the following way. Vertigo is not, sorry, vertigo is a film about viewing as a reviewing. Vision and consideration is always reflex, reflexive. Reconsideration and revision. And this is why Vertigo is a sublime tragedy. It states that we are, so to say, always out of phase. We, what we can finally reach is nothing 
but a second-hand reality. Something we have built up where reality itself goes on elsewhere. To handle reality is, if I may say so, to secondly handle reality, uh, to live with images. Thus, it is true that, in a sense, just in a sense, Vertigo says that images are, are, are sorry, the images are our necessary second-hand reality. <coughs> Let me give just an example, which is for me the peak of it all, one of the most tragic scenes, indeed, of the film history. If you have, if you have time, I show you again the, the scene, the entire scene. The moment when Scotty can kiss Madeleine come back to life. This is for me an unbearable shivering moment because we have a precipitate of all the twofoldness of the vertigo. At the same time, Scotty realizes it's his utmost desire and it's with a succedaneum. It's like, I don't know if you know David Lynch's films, it's like in David Lynch's greatest moment that show us that the, the coming true of a dream cannot but be kitsch. You realize what you want, but it's a cliche. But we have to conclude now with a fuller reading of the film. So we can agree that Vertigo seems to believe that the world is made of appearances. We have built ourselves. And hence it is deceptive, and even self-deceptive. This is one truth of Vertigo, one ideology, let's say, of Vertigo. This is borne out also by the fact that the most important theme of Vertigo is the double, the copy, the doppelganger, that always work as a trompe l'oeil. From start to finish, Vertigo is made of epiphanies, phantoms, troubles of visions. Okay, we cannot go into that, but it's very rich from this point of view. And just I would just outline that the, it's a trouble of the vision of Judy, Judy seems to, to, to see, a, thinks she sees a phantom, a black phantom, and she dies for it. Like at, at the beginning, uh, the film starts with the trouble of Dijon of Scotty. Scotty. Scotty doesn't see well, he has a trouble, and so someone dies. And all the film is with this problem of the vision. Uh, but uh, all this, uh, those images are appearing. But there is something more important than that, I will, I, I will underline. Vertigo can, say, can be seen as a huge game of substitutions of identities. First, Madeleine pretends to sub substitute Carlotta. Okay. Second, Jadi substitutes Madeleine, and she does it twice, once for Elster and once again for Scotty. Finally, we infer that, Madeleine in, that the Madeleine invented by Elster substitutes the Madeleine killed by Elster. A Madeleine whose identity we will never know. And here an immense problem arises. Who is then the Madeleine of the film? Not the Elfer's wife, but the, the Madeleine desired by Scott and hence by the spectator. Madeleine is a mix of at least, first, Esther's wife, second, Esther's film to deceive Scott, third, the way J Jadi plays the role of this film, four, some qualities Judy really has and allow her to embody the role. Fifth, five, five, the myth and aura of uh, Carlotta. Six, all the things that Scotty projects on this idea of Madeleine. Here we are finally at the core of, of my analysis. Madeleine is nothing but a projection, a film, an immense image. Scotty cannot join possess her for the only reason that she is an image. And I will come back to that in two minutes for my conclusion. Before I need to finish the list, the very long list of substitutions that constitute the film. For such list, list shows the power of the double vertigo is made of. There are two more kinds of substitutions. A parodic one. Uh, Midge pretending to lovely substitute Carlotta. And this is a, a wonderful uh, shot uh, because it is uh, very complicated to analyze. Uh, Midge makes a picture of the picture of uh, uh, Carlotta uh, looked by uh, Madeleine and then by Scotty. And here Hitchcock is filming 
Midge in front of the portrait she made, and so on. So it's a, it's a vertigo of uh, substitution of images. Eh? So this is the parodic, and uh, so Midge is very iconoclastic, and you see the reaction, very serious reaction of uh, Scott. He cannot, he cannot accept this iconoclastic approach to images. And there is also a nightmarish substitution. Eh? Scott is fearing, fearing in his nightmare to substitute Carlotta and then Madeleine. Eh? He identifies, eh? he, he thinks to, he's, he's falling in the grave of him, and so on. But it's not all. First and foremost, there is the chain of substitutions of every and each woman, women, women, sorry, woman, Scotty meets after the death of madness, and in which Scotty sees the image of madness, of uh, madness, sorry, <laughs> madness, Madeleine, Madeleine and madness, of course, um, until he falls on Judy. Eh? Concerning that point, we have to keep in mind two essential issues. First, how does Scotty see Madeleine in every woman he meets? He sees Madeleine's car, he sees Madeleine's coat, Madeleine's flower, and so on. In short, he sees the signs of Madeleine. That means that Madeleine is nothing but a set of signs. She's a composition, she's a picture. The picture Scotty wants to draw after on Judy. The sign he wants after to apply on Judy. Yeah? Um, until, the, until the climax, we, we see. So uh, this is the, 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 the whole picture, right? the double sense. Second, how can Scotty want to reset the Madeleine on Jody? Why Jody? Actually, we must not forget that Scotty doesn't know that Judy played the Madeleine. We know, but Scotty doesn't. Uh, Madeleine, for him, is really dead, and Jody is a perfect stranger, who simply reminds him of her. The choice of Jody is then not obvious at all. Or think, of, think about it. All the women in whom Scotty sees Madeleine, of all the, that, uh, that persons, Judy is really the less convincing. We, 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 are, we are deceived by all the other apparitions, but not by Judy, which is the true one, in a sense. The ultimate, uh, no, sorry, until the end, Judy will never be as beautiful, desiring, powerful as Madeleine. The ultimate subtle genius of the film is that Madeleine is deeply more convincing, fuller, radiant than Judy. In other words, an image is truer than the truth. Or better, an image is another truth. So this is, for me, another conclusion, very important conclusion of Vertigo. So, to to finish this very short analysis. The tragedy of Vertigo is not really for me that Scott is, the Scottish Madeleine and our Madeleine doesn't exist. The open drama is not that the image is false, misleading, deceiving. As a matter of fact, Madeleine is fascinating and desired precisely as an image, with nothing beyond. This is one of the, most, of the many mise en abyme of this in the film. Right? That is Madeleine, an image. The utmost tragedy of vertigo, an ultimate and harrowing paradox, is that the images are images of reality, and at the same time they are complete and full reality. So this is my proposition for, for 20 minutes analysis of vertigo. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, there are, we have some minutes together. I can show you some sequences of the film and then discuss it if you want, or we can just start a discussion by now. It's the, the, way, the way you want to prefer. If you have something uh, urgent to say now, or I can start with a, with a, with a scene you prefer, maybe, to, to be more concrete and to do some uh, uh, more focused analysis. So, I have to. The, if you see carefully the way the, the, the scene is shot and edited, the, all the work is like, for example, look how she, she comes from a frame. She comes from a frame, then she passes uh, uh, aside uh, and uh, she's in a profile. Profile is like, you know, 
for example, in coins, in uh, the, the portrait of uh, emperors, eh? because it's, uh, the, the, the profile doesn't look at you. So it's a, a, a reality that exists independently of you. Eh? So she's a profile, and then she, she disappears, so to say, with a mirror, like Alice in Wonderland, something like that. So, it's, so this is very interesting, and there are a lot of things very interesting. For me, what is very interesting beyond, beyond this analysis I make of uh, Vertigo is uh, the way Hitchcock can make us understand how Scotty cracked for Madeleine, and so we understand that he, this is a sort of first sight love, but in a silent, in a silent scene. In a silent scene, we understand that there is something happening, and this is the magic of each one. Huh? It is uh, so. Please look at the movement of the camera, the the, the play with the with the sound, uh, the the color when a metal passes. Uh, the, there is a, an intensity of light of uh, lightness. Uh, the the red becomes clearer, and so on. There is a magic composition each one makes in this, this one minute and a half scene. For me, that is perfect. Uh, is a perfect composition of cinematic. So let's try. See also this movement of the camera. Sorry, I stopped. Uh, sorry, because if you, are, you don't have much time to see it several times. This is also very interesting. This movement, this camera movement, this uh, traveling back, is not uh, Scottish uh, vision. It is not. It's a false uh, uh, point of view shot. Not a subjective shot. Because Scotty stays on his tool. He cannot move. But the camera moves in a, in a place where Scotty cannot be. So we see Madeleine in a place where Scotty cannot see Madeleine. And then we have a sort of a false uh, reverse shot. You will, you will see. And this is why it is magic. It is magic because it's sort of, uh, you know, you can, you can uh, in a very scholar way, do a subjective uh, point of view. Uh, uh, with the, from the position of the, of the character. But each of does more. He, he goes elsewhere and uh, you feel even more the subjectivity, the desire of Scotty toward Madeline. Of, toward Madeline. So please. Matching of the eyes, eh? they don't they this sort of yeah, yes, uh, this uh, out being out of phase like all the rest of the film. Eh? All all is, is is in there. And maybe just to finish and, and then uh, to to engage the discussion, I would like to show this sequence. Uh, uh, yeah, the sequence also for. This sequence for me, I, I, I think I saw this sequence, I don't know, a hundred times, and every time I got shivers with this sequence. Because I think of this, about th this question, whom do you love? Do you love, do you love uh, the one you want to love? Do you want uh, something you don't know, something you already know and you project? And this is this, this. so you, what happens when you desire, when you realize what you want to wanted to. So you're realizing what was already planned. So it's not reality. And so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a philosophical vertigo here. Total philosophical vertigo. You know what I mean? 
and uh, and from from a cinematic point of view, it's, it's also uh, brilliant. For example, the, the green, the green, it's uh, it's at the same time it's the the color of Madeleine. You cannot analyze that, but maybe you notice that the green is the sign also of Madeleine. So. But the green, and uh, you see when uh, she appears out of the door, uh, yeah, when she comes, she's like a, a, a green phantom. But it's also, of course, the color of the neon light of the hotel. So the, 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 let's, let's say that the paradise and the, I would say the hell, but the, 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 the most to that thing, eh? the, the, the less interesting uh, uh, place for a romantic story, of course, eh? this uh, second hand hotel with uh, this green neon light. Uh, it's, but it's, so it's, uh, it's sublime and it's ridiculous, and that's great. Eh? And I think this, as I said, is very Lynchian style. Eh? This idea. So I show you. And also, I can continue. I can continue for hours <laughs> on this film. Also, you, you you will notice the round movement. This uh, round traveling, eh? another spiral. Eh? And at the moment, what happens? Scotty sees uh, the past. There is a projection, another film, uh, another projection of uh, the past. That is uh, the place uh, he kissed last time Madeline. So it's very, uh, one, once more, it's uh, two minutes, it's very complex and it's, it's, a, it's a true work of art which we made here. Yeah, maybe if you speak. 
to get out of this okay. scenario. Um, well, the, the movie follows the, the plot of a detective and his misfortune and the, the, the fear of heights and stuff like that. And what I'd like to point out uh, uh, or say maybe my point of view is uh, that this is the moment that he figures out that Meredith and Judy, and Judy are the same person uh, simply because um, his vertigo or his dizziness is what helps him solve the case in a way. Um, the movie intends to tell us that um, the necklace is when he figures out that Judah and Madeline are the same person. And I think this is the moment where he he figures out that they are the same person simply because uh, he finds her. She's wearing uh, a, a green dress matching the car. And, you know, that's the first moment he sees Judy as her, as Judy. And he tries to follow her, he tries to go on a date with her and so on and so on. And he tries to become, she makes Judy become Meredith, not knowing that they are the same person. Um, and um, he, uh, as you said previously, as you started the debate, was um, that uh, he sees images or, or uh, Meredith to him are images. The, the hair, the costume, the shoes, the car, and so on. So he tries to achieve the hair, the dress, the shoes, the whatever, and at this point when uh, they are all on, the on one person, on the same person, and he kisses basically the same person twice, that is the moment he figures out that he kissed the same person the first time and now the second time, and from that point on, the, 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 the going to the church and so on, it's him figuring out, the, the solving the case basically, and um, viewing his point and sort of curing, curing his vertigo. Mm -hmm. His vertigo is what solves the case, basically. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much for this. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought about of this interpretation, so thank you. This, uh, this is what I like uh, when I discuss films, is that uh, everyone can uh, has another look on the film, so it's very interesting. But let me, if I may say, if I may, take, if I may tell you my point of view about the, your interpretation. Your interpretation is, for me, can be correct, but what, what annoys me is one point. Is that if I accept your interpretation, that would be that uh, Vertigo is, uh, is uh, mostly a thriller film. A thriller film, a, a detective film. Because you, so to say, reduce the, the sentimental film as a... As a something inside the fact that if we resolve the case, the film is finished, you know what I mean? Whereas, uh, for me, it is a most interesting interpretation is this schizophrenic uh, path of the film. It, is, it, is, it, it goes from, uh, from uh, the detective, Scott is a detective, and a lover. And your interpretation uh, means that at the end, what is important is that he is a detective; he has to solve the case. Uh, so, I, so I cannot uh, refuse this interpretation. But for me, is uh, is a is a poor interpretation of the film. Uh, I think that he resolves. I, I would say that he resolves the case like as an accident. So he becomes detective once more, and as a detective, so as a someone who wants to know the truth. The truth beyond images, you will be, you will have the truth, but you will lose the happiness in a sense. So this is this is the key of, the, the key of the tragedy so, since Oedipus, of course, eh? or Hamlet. Eh? Uh, do, you, do you want the truth? Okay, go until the truth. You will destroy everything. You will lose everything. You will be unhappy. So, but this is like an accident in a sense for me. In this uh, uh, this uh, pendulum, this uh, schizophrenia of the film of being in a sense uh, someone. Uh, Scotty, so the spectator, is uh, someone who wants to know the truth and wants to have the love. And uh, he has uh, cognition and affection. And, is, uh, so, and the film is about this struggle, in a sense, for me. And this is, what is why it's a tragic film. It's, uh, it's not a tragic it's in, on uh, just one level. It is, that is a truth that will make you happy, unhappy, sorry. This is the first level of tragedy. The most tragedy is that uh, you have to choose between this first level of tragedy or another way of living, living with images, which is another, 
another kind of reality. So, <laughs> so you know, so this is what I would, uh, I would, uh, yeah, answer to, you know, to your interpretation. But just to, to to tell you how rich is this film, I don't know if you've noticed that in the nightmare, Scotty sees the necklace. There is a moment where I can show you if you want. There is a moment where there is a, a zoom in uh, on uh, on a living uh, Carlotta. Carlotta is a living person, becomes a living person in his nightmare, and there is a zoom on the necklace, which is not justified at this point of the film. Why should the necklace be so important? So it is a sort of flash forward, is in an irrational flash forward. Uh, like in uh, also like in David Lynch films where you, you cannot find the reason for something just uh, this is the same you, and uh, even the the position I can show you the position at the end of the nightmare where it, where it, it falls on the grave of Carlotta is the same position he has at the very end of the film when uh, when Madeleine dies when Madeleine dies is like that at, on the, the top of the, the, the bell, bell tower and uh, yeah, it's the same. So it is also a sort of this irrational anticipa anticipation of this. Yes. Some other comments? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for this interesting uh, interpretation. I was just wondering whether you have any thoughts uh, on the, uh, the soundtrack to the movie. I mean, these strings, are they part of this spiral theme, or have you reflected mm, yeah. on that? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. This is a very important, po very important point because uh, I, I think you notice that because it's maybe for us today is uh, too much uh, for music because it's very uh, repetitive music and it is, this is uh, uh, orchestra, uh, very romantic uh, violins, uh, like sort of uh, I wouldn't say a parody, but uh, a remake of. Uh, Something like uh, Tristan und Isolde, uh, Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. Eh? The, you know this uh, this uh, this uh, spiral uh, themes that Wagner had, and uh, to signify this uh, the fact that you are uh, in uh, you screwed in, the, in love. And I think that is this. Uh, so yeah, move, so the, the 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 main theme of Vertigo is a, yeah is a spiral like, like Wagnerian style uh, spiral mu music. It, is, it, re it repeats, it repeats, and it uh, intensifies more and more, like, yeah. And uh, um, it gives the film, also contributes, contributes like in the scene of, in, at Ernest, in the first restaurant, uh, he saw so Madeleine. It, of course, it gives this touch of, also, of a passion point of view of the film. If you, cut the, if you cut the music, you don't have all this feeling, of course, of course. But yeah, it's not all, but uh, yeah. And what is also interesting, if you analyze the, the, the film from the point of view of music, is that uh, there are some, uh, I don't know if, if they are ironical, so sort of me meta, com a sort of commentary of the, of they are, uh, uh, they are uh, direct. There are some moments where the music seems to play, uh, okay, I will make you uh, fear, fear something. Uh, there is some uh, thrilling music, and then at the end there is not, no, not nothing. For example, when uh, uh, Scott is in the first moment, uh, he is following uh, Madeleine, and uh, he goes, she goes in this uh, uh, back street, and then she goes in this uh, uh, flower market, flower shop. But before the spectator knows that, uh, you enter this very dark place uh, and there is this music, typical kitsch, uh, stereotypy, the music of horror film. Ooh, and then, okay, you open just there are flowers, okay? And, uh, and uh, or when she, she goes in the woods uh, and there are this, uh, I think it's, I don't know if it's a uh, uh, synthetizator or uh, on the Martino, some very uh, synthetic uh, science fiction uh, uh, sounds <laughs> and then uh, you are in the woods uh, what happens uh, she disappears uh, so there is also this ironic uh, and what is interesting is that uh, Hitchcock plays with the spectators like he plays with Scotty Scotty is a skeptical Scotty is a total rational person who, be who becomes rational irrational at the end he becomes total mad so he, pa he passes from an extreme to another and uh, the, uh, is, it is like uh, um, Hitchcock does the same with the spectator. Before, you, you see, okay, it's a joke, come on, this is the story of Carlotta, it's, it's nonsense. 
and then you get totally involved with this uh, this this thrilling history. Okay, so uh, so music is fundamental. Thank you. How do you think uh, uh, the movies? So how do you think that uh, the I don't know, what, what's, what's your opinion uh, about the, the freshness of the movie, having in mind that it's shot like six years ago? For me personally, it's like quite slow, boring, naive, with the, I don't know, like the, the love story, I love you, uh, you know, like the whole kissing. And another question, can you compare it with some Italian big horror movies? Big horror movies? Yeah, Italian ones. Because, for example? I don't know, because you're Italian, so I, I guess maybe you... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, you know, like those like cheap, low-budget, uh, funny home movies. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, the first question is very, com a very difficult question. Uh, it is at a period where Hollywood is uh, sort of a ending point of his uh, classic style. It now, at, the very, at this very moment in Europe, there is the, the birth of new wave of uh, free cinema that is the end of the 50s. Uh, we already had uh, uh, muralism, so modern cinema. And this is uh, with actors playing very seriously, uh, with all this music, uh, all this uh, okay, cinema scope, all this effect. So of course, uh, um, I think that uh, Hitchcock today, if you think that of Hitchcock, of this film, I think you will think of, of almost all Hitchcock's films, because Hitchcock's films are very, um, let's, let's say, formalistic and stylized film. Uh, uh, so uh, today we are, we, are, we are used to irony, auto-irony, postmodern irony, or a very, very realistic effect. So Hitchcock is not, in, is, is not, not at all like that. Uh, so, so I understand that you can, cannot like, but maybe you don't like uh, Eisenstein and so on. All this formalistic cinema of this period, very. So, uh, maybe the first part, the beginning of the history of the story, sorry, is uh, is slow. Is, is slow. I mean, it's, uh, the other question is uh, a little uh, question. Uh, I mean, how to say, a sort of a digression you asked me to do, but just how to tell you in, in two words. Yeah, in the, I think that uh, uh, yeah, in this moment of the history of cinema, there were the uh, Hammer films, of, uh, English Hammer films, you know, this, uh, so the beginning of the, the second, uh, the, this, uh, this B-movie horror production of English, in English uh, cinema, and then the, the modernity, the modernity of uh, horror films was uh, in Italy in the 60s with, ba with Bava, uh, Mario Bava especially, and then Adela Argento. If you see these films of Bava of just a few years later, you are shocked by the violence and the, yeah, the, 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 the brutality you see in this film. And when you see Hitchcock, Hitchcock is like for children. For, so there is a... You, but I mean, a work of art has to, to, to be looked at in a story, with an historical eye. You can, I mean, you surely find Mozart boring, Bach boring, because it's not rock or pop or tech, I mean. So, I mean, uh, Proust is boring, Joyce is nonsense, I mean, okay. I can understand, but it's not my point of view. I think you have to, to see, with, to understand the idea of this. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Gian Maria. I think that we're finishing it here. We have another projection. And uh, who wants to stay for the citizens? go out and prepare the room and you can come back. Thank you.